Hey there, welcome to Takeaway with Sam Okus, a podcast from Nations Restaurant News. I am Sam Okus, editor in chief here at NRN, and this is the show where I give you an all access pass to the restaurant industry's most influential decision makers. This week, I'm talking with James Walker. He's the chief culinary and concept officer for Experiential Brands. James is a 30 year veteran of the restaurant industry, having been an executive for major chains such as Subway, Nathan's Famous and Johnny Rockets. Today, he's helping to drive concept development at Experiential Brands, a subsidiary of NRD Capital, which was founded by longtime restaurant franchisee Aziz Hashim. There are now three original brands under the Experiential umbrella, including the original Hot Chicken, Inked Tacos, and most recently, Pizza Roman Pizza. And the company is planning a unique expansion strategy for these brands that cross-utilizes each concept to maximize efficiencies and profitability for the franchisee. In fact, this interview was conducted in person inside a brick and mortar restaurant in Atlanta that houses both the original hot chicken and and inked tacos, and which will soon also include pizza as well. Uh, James joined the podcast to talk about why Experiential Brands is designing franchises from scratch for the sake of profitability and how the company has optimized each brand with expansion in mind. In this conversation, you will learn more about why social media provides such a great opportunity to craft a brand personality, why you should view ROI as a return on innovation, and how your economic model will determine the longevity of your brand. Jumping now into my interview with Experiential Brands Chief Culinary and Concept Officer, James Walker. Also, don't forget to stick around after the interview as I will share my six takeaways from this discussion, actionable insights that you can take with you on the go. For generations, Butterball has delivered only quality American-grown turkey. They provide products that please patrons while delivering versatility to operators in all segments. But Butterball doesn't stop there. As an organization, they're always looking for ways to empower operators to be at their best. From recipes that inspire culinary creativity to insights and trends that can help drive business decisions, it's all at ButterballFoodService.com. Okay, I'm sitting here with James Walker, the Chief Culinary and Concept Officer for Experiential Brands. James, thanks for joining today. Um, James, I think everybody listening probably knows who you are. You've been in this industry 30-odd years or so. Um, with Which some... is pretty good because I'm only 35. Yeah, so. it's incredible yeah, you started so yeah. young. <laughs> but And everyone on the podcast will know who I am because it's just going out to my family, you said. Yes, exactly. This is a private channel that we're sending this out on. Yeah, exactly. That's how podcasts work. Family podcast. Right. So you, I mean, you have experience with Johnny Rockets, with Subway, Baja Fresh, many other well-known brands. Now you are working on experiential brands. Um, Tell me about what experiential brands is. Fantastic. Uh, Experiential brands was the I'm going to say brainchild of uh, Aziz Hashim. Uh, you may know him from being chairman of the International Franchise Association, 40 years in the industry as a franchisee and franchisor, uh, a holding company under his uh, private equity group, NRD Capital. You probably saw them in the news. They owned a brand called Fuzzy's Taco, uh, which was one of the holdings of experiential brands that was sold to uh, another organization. And today, Experiential Brands houses the three brands that I think we're here to talk about. Yeah. The original hot chicken, Ink Tacos, and Pinza Roman Pizza. Yeah, and we are sitting inside one of those locations. Second location, right? For Sec- second brick and mortar location. Second brick and mortar location on a unfinished secret mezzanine level with secret. future, future <laughs> use in mind. Yes, I, I walked in and you told me here on the mezzanine there's going to be another brand put into this mezzanine. So we're sitting in the what will become someday the third brand, which is the Pinza's Pizzas. Is that correct? Correct. Pinza Roman Pizza. Pinza Roman Pizza. Yes. All right. So this is incredible because, I mean, between you and Aziz, you guys have obviously many decades of experience in food service. And what I appreciate about what you're doing with experiential brands and these concepts is you're, you're building them from scratch as something to be a plug and play efficient model for franchisees 
tell me about why this is something you guys wanted to do. Why did you wanted to develop these franchise, franchises from scratch? Uh, you know, when you look at Aziz's background, not only being a franchisee, but a franchisor and then chairman of that franchise organization, he wanted to have brands that were very focused on franchisee profitability. We all love to serve food that we're proud of, and I, we just, I, I guess we can tell people, we just fed you yes. 5,700 calories. <laughs> yes. you, did a, you did a Joey Chestnut job at getting through it. I'm not eating for another three days. I, yeah. And I did warn you. I texted <laughs> you, you this morning. I'm like, do no not breakfast. eat breakfast. <laughs> and I did that. Uh, you know, franchisees, operators, restaurateurs want to be proud of the customer experience that we're able to cultivate for our guests. Mm. We want to have food that we're proud of, but ultimately, Aziz wanted to have brands that would show a rapid return on investment for franchisees. That was near and dear to his heart. He says things to me like, is this a brand that you would franchise to a loved one, to your mother, to your children, you know, to, to a family member? And does it have an economic package and a return on investment that you're proud of? Mm -hmm. So really, there weren't brands out there that today offered that. There's certainly brands that have been built to be very large organizations today that started with that model, but through menu proliferation or changes in consumer dining trends, cost inflation, let's say build out inflation, those brands no longer offer that same return on investment to franchisees. So really the genesis, the start, the brainchild that Aziz had is let's create brands that offer this profit focused franchise model and return on investment for franchisees. Now, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. We do that through the customer experience, through the model, through the engineering, through the labor model, through the build out, all of those types of, of elements go into that. But that really was uh, the start of experiential brands. I'm curious, obviously a brand, um, you know, there's, there's a, a relational aspect of it with customers. There is a, sort of brand recognition and um, name recognition and sort of, the, you know, understanding the story of a brand. And in, in developing brands from scratch, how do you overcome that hurdle that customers have no idea what these brands are? Now, they, of course, have a great experience when they come, but there is always that hurdle of trial. And what is this all about? How do you guys overcome that hurdle? Uh, I think we all read, uh, I think it's Ken Blanchard, Selling the Invisible. So mm. once you read that, your name, your logo really needs to say it all. Uh, I, I think I was telling you a story that when we look at developing these brands, you come up with a brand positioning. Where is the brand going to sit? Uh, is it something that customers want today? So, for example, Nashville Hot Chicken, you know, it is as trendy and in demand as anything I've seen in, in a, as you said, lengthy career that I won't mention how long. <laughs> uh, you know, high quality tacos really anchored with birria tacos. These are, these are trendy things right now. So we knew that the brands would fit into a segment that is in demand. Coming up with names that were easy, approachable, uh, easy to remember, iconic logos, that all goes into it. One mm -hmm. of the things I had mentioned to you that I do is just kind of a, let's call it an early customer litmus test. When we came up with the names and we were working through final logos, getting the trademarks in place, the URL, all the things you have to do today. It's not simple, right? It used to be, you know, it's it's Sam's Chicken and away we go yeah. and you open and at some point, you know, somebody says maybe you should call a lawyer and get that trademark. None of that happens anymore. Now it's, mm -hmm. you know, can you get the URLs and, you know, the .edus, .coms, you know, all of that. <laughs> but in the early stages, I would have t-shirts made. And, you know, I've got my original hot chicken, I've got a dress shirt on, mm. but I would get, uh, you know, an Ink Tacos t-shirt made, uh, an original hot chicken t-shirt made, and I would wear it out in public. I'd wear it on a plane, and I, I would call Aziz, I'd say, you know, I flew to Atlanta yesterday. I had three people on the plane say, where is that restaurant? And, you know, or where... Where can I buy that shirt? It was those types of early things, not just what our internal team and internal paneling and consumer paneling, all those things that you should do when you're developing a brand, putting it in front of guests and do they recognize it? Do they like it? Do they feel an affinity for it? But also just that, you know, kind of grandmother research of wearing the shirt. Mm -hmm. uh, the other exercise I like to go through is if I say a, a name, 
the original hot chicken and I show you the logo, maybe just that graphic that's on the wall behind you, if I show you that and say, okay, so you don't know this brand, it's you're, you're from outer space, because obviously everybody in the U.S. has heard of the original hot chicken, but <laughs> you know, somebody from uh, Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, and I'm showing them this logo, the name, and I say, tell me what you think that restaurant would be about. And they'd say, well, it's, uh, it's fried chicken. It's spicy fried chicken. I bet they have French fries. Mm. I bet they have milkshakes. I bet they have mac and cheese. You should be able to have guests really identify a lot about you in their mind. Mm -hmm. And I think you want them to be at least 80% correct, that they're not gonna come in and say, well, I saw the logo, the original hot chicken. I came in and I was really expecting, you know, Angus beef burgers. No, you, mm -hmm. you want the brand to match the expectations set by the name and the graphics and, and those types of things. Uh, I think also today you have an advantage in that social media is so powerful that you can begin to craft in the minds of customers um, the tone, the personality, all of those types of things uh, that a brand is able to convey through video and through social media that's hard to do just in static print. You know, right. the guys at Wendy's do a great job, right? I grew mm -hmm. up on Wendy's. I remember the first time I got a square hamburger being blown away. Didn't know that they came that way, you know. Mm -hmm. And today that edgy Rick and Morty vibe that the, the team at Wendy's has been able to create I think allows you to grow in the minds of, of customers and build that affinity. It's the first time I've heard Rick and Morty use as an adjective, so that's, that's a, I want a Rick quarter and... anytime anybody does that. <laughs> a Rick and Morty vibe, that's amazing. Exactly. So, um, Inked Tacos in particular, um, you know, you, t you talked a little bit about what you want original hot chicken to communicate. Tell me about Inked, because you were telling me a little bit about this earlier, but one thing that people can't see, of course, on the podcast is you guys have tattoo chairs down here in the entryway and there is this there are, there are these great graphics around the walls here in the restaurant that I told you these all look like they could be tattoos sure, because yeah. that's kind of the vibe you're going for tell me what Inked Ta Tacos is supposed to communicate as a brand so uh, you know I think today uh, tattoos are a little different today than maybe they were 20 years ago they are more mainstream, mm -hmm. uh, but also there's that counterculture vibe. It's about individuality, mm -hmm. right? You Nobody wants the same tattoo. They want it to be a little different and they want to tweak it and design it. Uh, and I really think that's the, the culture that Ink Tacos has. We want to be a little irreverent. We want to be a little counterculture. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be a little edgy, but we also want to be about you know, individuality, uh, people being able to personalize their experience. And the way that we accomplish that at Ink Tacos is through the salsa bar. We allow uh, our, our, our guests to really tailor their heat level and their flavors, whether they want smoky and sweet with chipotle honey, or they want the mango or the habanero or, you know, any of those flavors, we allow them to kind of cultivate an experience in the way they like. Mm. But yes, the, the name, uh, it's, it's edgy, it's counterculture. And if you look at our, our menu, you know, birria tacos, I don't think there's any other national chain that's doing legitimate birria tacos on a plancha you know, with slow braised beef and consomme. Sure. So we want to be on the edge culinarily as well. Yeah. Am I right to say that, did these brands launch as virtual concepts or they exist as virtual concepts in some markets to currently, right? So they uh, were never really designed to be virtual brands. Okay. Um, because we created these brands for today's environment, meaning mm -hmm. the number of employees you have to have being as minimal as you possibly can, can have, executing chef-driven cuisine, but being able to do so with uh, as easy a, uh, an operational model as possible. In addition to that, we created the brands to be brands that delivered very well. As I mentioned to you, I dared you, take some original hot chicken home, <laughs> it's gonna be crispy in 90 minutes, and I don't know how far you live from here, but I'm, <laughs> might be, it's in Atlanta, so listen, it's gonna take you 90 minutes wherever you're going. I live in Ohio, so it's gonna be a lot further than that. <laughs> uh, but it will still be crunchy, so, yeah. so 
the food and the menu was designed to be delivered, mm -hmm. but it was designed from a business model standpoint to have traditional brick and mortar. Now we are beginning really to answer demand from other restaurants that are asking for us to consider allowing them to execute in more of that virtual uh, type environment. But these mm -hmm. were designed to be brick and mortar brands and that 100% is the tent pole in the overall business model and future of these brands. Our brick and Got mortar, it. being able, we're experiential brands. We want to execute a great guest experience. We, we're doing that through brick and mortar. Sure. So why three brands? Because you guys could have come out and just done original hot chicken, just did ink tacos. You guys have specifically decided to, decided to do three brands um, with the idea that you could sell these as a package to franchisees. Mm -hmm. What goes into that decision? So, as you mentioned, the, the Original Hot Chicken was the first brand we launched, and economically, from a sales standpoint, from a guest acceptance standpoint, we absolutely could have been done. Uh, the brand worked well, sales were very strong, consumer acceptance, uh, reviews all very, very strong. Adding Ink Tacos, which we were able to add uh, at a minimal capital expenditure. The additional equipment is minimal. It basically leverages the existing original hot chicken equipment package. What it did for the financials uh, really was very, very attractive. And going back to the fact that we want to be profit-focused franchisors, really focused on the financial well-being and the return on investment for our franchisees, adding that second brand made a great deal of sense and these brands are designed to fit together synergistically so the menus work well together the equipment package so we're not taking two disparate existing brands and saying well let's put them together in the same space mm -hmm. we're saying what if we created brands that were designed to fit together in the kitchen and designed to make sense on a menu board so in the case of ink tacos and the original hot chicken you have those two brands now, in the case of Pinza Roman Pizza, uh, this is a third brand that we developed, and the idea was to have a brand that delivered a best-in-class pizza experience, but did so in less than two minutes. And we didn't really feel that was anywhere out on the market. So really ready for airports, travel plazas, high volume locations, um, universities. And it really was uh, individuals coming in and looking at Inked and the original hot chicken saying, I want both of these brands. I love the way that helps me minimize my real estate costs. All of my fixed costs drop exponentially by adding that, that minimal capital expenditure to add the second brand. And they said, but wait a minute, what is, what's this pincer Roman pizza? Is that something I could add as well? Mm -hmm. So really the goal currently is to have the original hot chicken and inked as the primary brands and to have pincer roman pizza be an opportunity where it makes sense so uh where you have a restaurant that's large like this uh we're looking at second generation spaces that have grease traps and hvac and the hooding and ventilation and if they have the square footage that would support a third brand yes we do have that third brand or in a high rent area like Manhattan where you're just doing everything you can to ensure that franchisees have every possibility at seeing that rapid return on investment. So I would say two strategic brands designed strategically to work together within the same space. Mm -hmm. You notice I didn't say co-branding. <laughs> uh, and you saw from the outside, the mm -hmm. signage really tried to create that individual brand identity for the original hot chicken and ink, and then opportunistically where it makes sense to have that pinza Roman pizza. And we were speaking earlier about how, um, you know, this is a great opportunity. You guys have the menu boards right next to each other. You order at the same place. I mean, the branding is still pretty separate. It, you know, you can tell this is a couple different concepts, a couple different menus, but you pull them together very well. And as we were saying, you guys have a lot of people who are ordering the same ticket has multiple of the <coughs> concepts, right? So. Um, I imagine that's desired. You want the sure. experience to be to people to come in and have multiple options. So where possible would you encourage the franchisees to do multiple of the brands or does it all just come down to what the franchisee wants? No, I, I would say these brands work well together from a customer experience standpoint. They work very well in the kitchen. 
and they work very well from a return on investment standpoint. Mm -hmm. So I would say we absolutely would encourage potential franchise owners to do both Inc. and the original hot chicken in the same space. Mm -hmm. Now, as you mentioned, these brands absolutely work well on their own. They have enough of a draw. Uh, they drive enough AUV to be standalone brands because there's going to be opportunities where uh, because of competitive restrictions by a landlord that you couldn't do one or the other, we have that third opportunistic brand that we might be able to plug in or any of these brands really do have, I think, the consumer acceptance to live on their own. Mm -hmm. But wherever possible, we'd encourage franchisees to do the original hot chicken and ink tacos together. Tell me about the digital uh, footprint of these brands because, again, I mean, you know, and why I asked about virtual brands earlier is because, you know, virtual brands suddenly became this playground of brand development and you sure. could build anything from scratch and throw it out there. Now, of course, as we are discovering right now, that wasn't for some companies the throw greatest it, business throw model. Throw it out being, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But it wasn't the greatest business model, although I think there is obviously a, a seed of an idea there that's still very, very relevant. But for you guys, as you put these brands out into the world, they're going to be individual concepts on the third party sure. marketplaces. But how does that all work in concert with, you know, ideally a DoorDash driver would know to pick up the mm -hmm. two concepts or the three concepts food here, take it to, or that the customer could order multiple concepts in one order. How, I guess, how do you, how do this, how does this all translate to the digital marketplace in the end, since you have multiple concepts? I, I think it it's, was something that we contemplated right from the beginning, mm. that uh, our food would have to travel, it would have to be well suited for a delivery cycle that in many cases we can't control once that food leaves our door. It's in the hands of you know a third-party driver, so we want it to be packaged well. We want it to hold up uh, to that delivery cycle. But from a technology standpoint, we contemplated and worked with best-in-class partners. So our third-party marketplace partner is Franklin Junction. Franklin Junction really helps us manage the third-party marketplaces as well as our own one PD site. And the advantage, I think, uh, going back to Gene Lee when he was CEO, now he's grand chairman. Emeritus Admiral, something. Yeah. Something. <laughs> something. Yeah. Sounds uh, right. uh, you know, talked about, you know, listen, you need to own that customer data. I think he was the first person I heard, like, you know, kind of pound the table saying, you need to own this. And our goal is really to drive people to that one PD site where we're able to have greater control of that delivery cycle. Now, ultimately, it's going to be delivered by third-party independent contractor drivers, but it does allow us not only to own that customer information, but to your point, to begin to say, so you're ordering the original hot chicken, and you're super excited, you're ordering two chicken sandos, uh, a banana pudding, and french fries. Are you sure you wouldn't like to have a birria taco? Right. I'm pretty sure everybody wants to have a birria taco. Mm. Or if you're ordering tacos, would you like to add, you know, a Nashville hot chicken tender? The answer is yes. So the ability to put more of our brands together, offer more options for the customer, is something that absolutely we're excited about doing. We do it on our one PD site, and Franklin Junction really handles that. So it allows the team here within experiential brands to focus on the customer experience in the restaurant while Franklin Junction cultivates that same customer experience in a digital marketplace. Yeah, I imagine because that, I mean, that's going to maximize your profitability because you're going to get the attention of two brands worth in front of the customer instead of just one brand's worth. So, I mean, that's everything about these concepts is how do you maximize what you can do out of one footprint, right? Absolutely. And I think also understanding um, frankly, the importance of customer experience wherever that customer experience takes place. Mm -hmm. So if I walked into one of our restaurants during a meal period and I found the manager was in the office on the phone with DoorDash instead of in the dining room with the live customers, I probably wouldn't be super happy. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and, and what Franklin Junction does is they take that management of, you know, the Uber Eats and the DoorDash and, and really the digital business off of our hands. So the team in the restaurant is present. They are here focused on ensuring the best possible customer experience. I think sometimes restaurateurs forget 
that managing the delivery cycle, even if you're not managing the drivers, but managing that digital virtual, as you said, experience can be quite time consuming and frankly quite onerous. Mm -hmm. Better off to leave that to a group that specializes in that. So the team here is focused on is the HVAC at the right level? Is the music at the right level? Are the tables clean? Are the, are, are the chicken tenders crunchy and flavorful and moist? And are the birria tacos the best tacos anybody's ever had? Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier to have them focus within the four walls. I love that everything about this, these concepts is, is really thought through for the long term. And you've got some things coming down the pike that you've you've fully developed and not even released yet because you guys have thought through so many things leveraging your many years in, of experience in the restaurant industry tell me about that how, how did you guys develop these with a long runway knowing that there's going to have to be some longevity to these to make them legitimate you know uh, I think we've had great leadership from Aziz and you know he knows where he wants to be uh, I, I've known Aziz, I think, for the better part of 20 years, and one of the things that I've always admired about him is uh, the success that he's had uh, in, in growing organizations and returning, um, basic return on investment for shareholders and now return on investment for franchisees. And I think part of how he does that, uh, very disciplined, uh, disciplined and creative, and it's great to have that under one roof so mm -hmm. he shows a return on innovation i want to quarter anytime anybody says that <laughs> uh but also where do you want to be in five years so uh many months ago he said you know james would you put together a strategic roadmap for international and i said yeah absolutely you know uh you know do you want that tonight or do you want that tomorrow and he says no take you know take a human you know, uh, time to do that mm. and, you know, send me something that's well thought out. And I said, well, what are you looking at next year, next 18? I said, no, I like to look at everything in five year increments. Where can we be internationally with these brands? And I'm bringing this up now because we talk mostly about the domestic business. Mm -hmm. Where can we be internationally in five years? And, you know, I did put that together for him. But going back to when you when you're creating these brands based on phenomenal industry experience that the team, uh, which Aziz is certainly the leader of, but we've got a great team and you've met several of the leaders today, mm -hmm. we were able to build brands that are able to rapidly and successfully compete in an international marketplace. So if you think of some great brands in the United States, they have a very sophisticated and by sophisticated, maybe I mean complex supply chain mm -hmm. uh, that is very difficult to move to an international marketplace. In the case of the original hot chicken, there is one proprietary SKU, and we have the ingredients where we can make that in any of our, the international markets that we're looking at going into. Similarly mm -hmm. with Inked, we make the salsas from scratch. We have the recipes. We're able to really tailor that from a spiciness level, a sweetness level, or a saltiness level on a market-by-market -market basis. So these brands really strategically um, are well positioned to go into an international marketplace, to not have the friction that supply chain causes some of our contemporaries, but also allows them to be price competitive. Mm. So a lot of times you'll see a great American brand pop up in uh, there was one, I won't mention the name, that I went to their first location in India mm. and it was a brand that made, let's call them round sandwiches. <laughs> uh, and these round sandwiches, I think when I did the math, it was $13 and I was asking my host, I said, how will that compete in this marketplace? And they said, it won't, mm. it can't survive. It will, it will do well for a few months because it's an American brand and it's exciting and it's innovative, but it can't compete at that price level. Because we've been able to strategically tailor these brands to be able to go into an international marketplace without adding a lot of cost because of supply chain, it allows us to go in at a very competitive, you know, let's call it 15% above market pricing, which I think is absorbable. Mm -hmm. An American brand can compete if an average meal is $3 and you're going to be at, let's call it $3.45, you'll probably be able to compete. If your supply chain puts you in a position where the market says $3 and you've got to be at 
five dollars and ninety five cents you won't be able to compete yeah. so part of the creation of these brands has allowed us to to move towards internationally um, acceptance and competitive positioning much more rapidly well that's amazing I mean you've got two brick and mortars and you're already talking about international expansion and obviously confident in these concepts but why already think about international? What, what do you think the opportunity for this is internationally? I think the, the international marketplace is ready for brands like these. Mm. Um, you know, in the U.S., there are a fair number of hot chicken brands. I'm not aware of any that are pickle brined, southern tempura basted, and mm. cornflake roll. That's right. Original. <laughs> Original on that. Uh, but there's a lot of hot chicken players, and some of them are just really fantastic. Uh, but as you go international, there is demand for that that is currently unanswered. And uh, Mexican is something that I've seen a demand for in Brazil and in the UK and in the GCC that really is not answered at the level of quality of ink tacos. So I think international is less us running... Uh, and saying, hey, let's go here. There is demand. Mm -hmm. There is opportunity to still achieve kind of that first in advantage. And we're not looking at going international and leaving the U.S. behind. We are absolutely looking at growing in the U.S. and Canada uh, in, in a very strategic way with basically individual franchise owners and multi-unit operators that are like-minded. And by mm -hmm. like-minded, yes, they're very focused on that return on investment. They speak to the financials and the economic engine, but also are passionate about the customer experience. So you will see us grow both internationally and domestically. Mm -hmm. And I would add domestically, these brands have been crafted in a way that allows them to look at you know airports, colleges, and universities in a way that works for their operations teams. And imagine between you and Aziz, you guys must have a lot of contacts in the franchise world from your experience. So I imagine there are a lot of franchise groups that would be hungry for something like this, but who is the ideal franchise candidate? Because you mentioned that you would do individual um, franchises as well as multi-concept groups. Do you want to keep this flexible to consider everybody, or is there an ideal candidate that you would think is best at this? Well, I think the ideal candidate is still the ideal candidate whether they want to do one location, three locations, or 30 locations. In fact, I think today alone, mm -hmm. we had groups approach us uh, that really wanted to be in that 30, and Aziz talked them into three. Mm. He, did, he did a great job at selling them from 30 down to three mm -hmm. uh, because we want to make sure that we have like-minded individuals, that it really is a good marriage, if you will, uh, between franchisor and franchisee, that their expectations are being met, that the customer's expectations are being met. So this is not a race to, to see how many locations uh, we can open or how rapidly we can open them. The demand is there, as you mm. mentioned. We, we know a lot of individuals. Aziz certainly knows thousands of franchisees and potential franchise owners based on his background. This is not how fast can we grow, it's how quickly can we make wise decisions for the longevity, not only of the brands, but of the individual locations. So when we're looking at a difficult marketplace like New York City, mm -hmm. we could be open in New York City certainly by the end of summer. It's not about how quickly we can open there, it's can we open in a way that we're still there mm. in 20 years. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to being laser focused on the economic model and the return on investment. So it's not about how quick can we open, it's opening locations that are going to be there in 10, 15, and 20 years. Sure. Walk me through then the process of a franchisee coming on board for this particular company. I mean, say I'm in, I live in Omaha and I'm looking for a good franchise concept. Um, you know, I partner up with you guys. Am I signing a deal for all three brands right off the bat? Am I signing a deal for just one with the option of the others? How do you construct a deal when you have these multiple brands in your portfolio like you do? So it's really looking, and this is what I like about having a portfolio of brands, is we look at the individual location. So generally, we're looking at uh, a potential franchise owner and, and that first location and what makes sense for that location. So more often than not, as I said, our real strategic thrust 
is the original hot chicken and ink under the same roof. So if they have a site, will it work for those two brands to cohabitate within that same location? If they don't have a site, and as you said, they're, they're coming to us with a marketplace. Listen, I, I, I came in for lunch, I came in for dinner, I love the brands, I've got to have them. Mm. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this a little closer to home. Mm. I'm in Houston, Texas. Sure. I, you, you mentioned somewhere, yeah, that's Omaha, bigger uh, Omaha, city. I don't know. Yeah, that's, <laughs> was that like that's that's your dart throwing I just, I just right shoot in the middle? For the middle of the country. Okay, that's right. <laughs> All right, so Houston, Texas. You know, I love your two brands. If they've got a site, will it work for those two brands? Great. If not, they don't have a site. We would say, great. Let's go look for a site that we think has a lease package that will work for our economic model. And again, our overarching focus of being a profit-focused franchisor, return on investment for franchisees, let's go find a site that makes sense, that has the square footage, preferably as a second generation space where we're not paying to put in hooding ventilation, grease traps, is in a high traffic area that these two brands can plug into. Mm, okay. So thinking about the future then, I mean, you talked about Aziz talking this one group out of 30 down to three. And it's interesting because, you know, some people, they think, oh, 30, yes, I, I, let's do 50. Let's do as many as it takes, right? But you guys clearly are demonstrating some restraint, even though you have ambitious goals. How, how quickly are you trying to get these out the door and ready for franchisees and scaling them? Uh, I would say I'm... I'm scanning my brain that's what that pause is you know do, accessing the ram drive uh we do not have conversations about how fast we can go we have conversations about making wise decisions uh and i go back to aziz looking at things in kind of five year increments where are we going to be in five ten and twenty years uh so it's less about you know how quick are we going to fill up a market or what does that look like it's more how can we make wise decisions that uh, are going to be decisions that we're really proud of five years from now mm -hmm. if this was just you know listen let's go sign a bunch of deals my job would be much easier um, it's really finding the right individual putting them in a location where the rent package makes sense that they're going to see a return on investment and if they open three locations they will be back asking very aggressively for those other 27 locations but right. this is not a race to see how many locations we can open this really is about doing the right thing uh, for the franchise owner, mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned, you know, is this a brand, is this a deal that you would encourage a family member, your mother, your sister, your child to sign? Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at things through those optics, it's not about let's go fast. It is much more about let's go smart. You mentioned earlier the demand for franchising right now, which I find really interesting because I think, you know, Certainly, last last couple of years we've gone through, I think, have made a case for franchising. Right, <laughs> usually where there's some sort of calamity or chaos in the world, franchising's appealing because you have more support and that partner there with you. Um, but also, I think about the industry today, and you know, obviously the major chains are pretty inaccessible for franchisees. Mm -hmm. If you're a new person coming into franchising, you're not coming into Burger King, McDonald's, Taco Bell, of course. Right. Um, those are out of out of reach. So there, I imagine there must be a demand for franchising emerging brands, probably fast casual in particular, but you tell me, what do you see as being the demand and how these concepts are meeting that demand? You know, we've tried to keep the capital expenditure as reasonable as possible. Uh, we've avoided proprietary equipment or limiting the number of vendors, so a potential franchisee if they have a, a sign vendor that they've got a fantastic deal with and they're able to shave a few dollars off, we're all about minimizing the capital expenditure to get open. And I think when you look at, uh, there was a sandwich brand that did quite well that I was associated with for a period of time. And that brand, when it really grew very, very rapidly, part of why it grew is the the dollar amount to get in was kept as low as possible and there was a great focus on not only minimizing the investment but maximizing the return on investment mm -hmm. so I think we appeal not only to 
let's call it sophisticated legacy franchisees who might be part of one of those other fantastic systems you mentioned who are saying, listen, I can no longer justify spending 800 or a million, 800,000 or a million dollars and seeing a return on investment seven, eight years down the line. I just can't do it. Right. They're looking for something that is fun and exciting, that appeals to customers in a really, really palpable way, and these brands do, but also appeals to their business side. So I think you will see us uh, partner with those legacy, more sophisticated, long-tenured uh, franchisee groups, mm -hmm. but also new groups that are saying, listen, this, this will be my first foray, and I just can't afford to spend eight hundred thousand uh, dollars. I need something that I can get into for, you know, three hundred thousand plus or minus uh, that I feel good about. Uh, you know, you're going to be certainly more successful if you feel good about uh, the brand that you're associated with and are a franchisee of. So I think you'll also see us appeal to those first time franchisees. I think also with what's going on in the economy right now, you're seeing a lot of folks, you know, uh, that are maybe less enthusiastic to go to work than they might have been four or five years ago. Yeah. They went home for COVID, they worked for home, uh, maybe they're less excited about going back to work. So you're seeing uh, first time franchisee candidates that are in their 40s and 50s who will be fantastic franchisees who are, are serious minded, uh, they're good with people, they're good with finances, and they're looking for something uh, that appeals to customers, appeals to their financial side, but also is easy to execute. And these brands by design are easy to operate, easy in the kitchen, easy to execute a fantastic customer experience. Sure. All right, James, last question for you. Um, you know, all of this really is a, such a story of brand development. You guys have, from scratch, developed these very mature brands already because you've thought through so many things from your career, from your experience. And I'm just curious, going, having gone through this process now of developing these brands from scratch, what are some tips to the audience that you would give for anybody who wants to develop something from scratch in 2023? What are some things to consider? What, what, what are the to-dos? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm going to kind of glean from that question just kind of piece of advice. And sure. I think uh, when you're developing something, ensuring, I'll, I'll use that term again, that there is a return on innovation. Mm -hmm. um, kind of coming out of COVID and during COVID, we're seeing right now, and I know you report on this a, a lot, you know, that the technology ecosystem that was around the restaurant business and the grocery business, a lot of those uh, tech solutions are struggling right now. Mm -hmm. um, and not, not to mention any names. And I think what I saw in some of those companies is there was innovation for innovation's sake. Mm. You need to make sure if you are innovating within your organization that there truly is a return on innovation. That if you're doing something new, it's because there is a demand for it or an opportunity, but in some way you are going to be able to monetize against that investment. Now that's not to put the brakes on innovation. Uh, and I think there's there's kind of a careful balancing act between saying, listen, you know, as long as you're innovating, I'm good with it, or saying, listen, if this doesn't catch fire on day one, I'm angry that you spent the money. I'm saying there needs to be a return on innovation. The other piece of advice I would say is understanding the difference between emotion and passion. Mm. So I am very passionate uh, about these brands, but I can tell you I personally avoided uh, taking part in consumer tasting panels or sampling panels of different products or different ingredients because I didn't want to sway things one way or another. It's not about whether I like a, a specific sauce or dressing. It really is about what the customers think. So I tried to spend a lot more time walking through the dining room, asking customers what they thought of the products and what they would change. Uh, and it was fairly well into the development of these brands before I started trying the products because it just was immaterial whether I liked them or whether they catered right. to me. It was much more important. So I think understanding there is a difference between passion and emotion. And passion is certainly going to help drive the brands. If you look at uh, 
brands, you know, the, the ones we've talked about, you know, In-N-Out Burger and Chick-fil-A and McDonald's, these are fantastic brands. You know, there was a lot of passion that went into them. Emotion and emotional attachment to something that doesn't drive the economic engine is something I think to be wary of. That's good advice. James Walker of Experiential Brands, appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks so much. For generations, Butterball has delivered only quality American-grown turkey. They provide products that please patrons while delivering versatility to operators in all segments. But Butterball doesn't stop there. As an organization, they're always looking for ways to empower operators to be at their best. From recipes that inspire culinary creativity to insights and trends that can help drive business decisions, it's all at ButterballFoodService.com. That was my interview with Experiential Brands Chief Culinary and Concept Officer, James Walker. So what should you learn from this interview? Here are my six takeaways. My first takeaway is that developing a brand from scratch is harder than ever. Uh, James made the point that it used to be you could call something, you know, Sam's Burgers, go trademark it, open a restaurant, and out you go. Uh, But these days, there's so much more to consider. You have to consider, as he said, the URL, the website. You have to consider a social media handle. You got to consider, of course, trademarks, uniqueness to the market. So many things that uh, you have to think about when you develop a brand from scratch, which for me makes it so interesting that that is what experiential brands is all about, almost like they're making it harder on themselves. But they clearly know a thing or two about developing brands. And James really got into some of those points of what to consider. When you do develop a new brand, you have to think about how it resonates with the customer. Do do they have affinity with that kind of brand? Do they recognize it? Do they know what it is all about? When they see the logo, they hear the name. All of those things are things you should consider as you develop a brand because you want it to really pop with the customer. James made the mention that uh, when he travels, he travels with a t-shirt of uh, original hot chicken. And he said people stop him and ask him, where is that restaurant? You're essentially being a billboard for your concept. But importantly, that logo, that name, those things are, are, catch people's eyes. If it was some very obscure name with some very obscure logo, nobody's going to ask James where that restaurant is. But the, they intentionally designed this logo, this branding for each of the three concepts we spoke of to, to really connect with a customer. And that's what you have to do when you design a brand from scratch. My second takeaway related to that is that social media provides a great opportunity to craft a brand personality. So even though it's harder than ever to develop that brand, consider some of the tools you have at your disposal disposal today in order to do that. Social media, YouTube, podcasts, videos, all these things in which you can get out there and make, uh, I, I view it almost like, like making your brand 3D. Once upon a time, it was 2D. It was a logo on paper. These days, it's like a 3D kind of branding experience where you can get in depth on what that brand is all about. Give it a personality. Uh, one good touch point James offered in this interview was Wendy's and how they use their social media to give Wendy's uh, a personality, a vibe that it didn't really have before. And I think that's a great example um, and a benchmark when you develop your own brand on how to how do you craft that personality online. My third takeaway is that you can design new restaurants to house multiple brands with minimal capital ex- expenditure. Uh, expenditure, excuse me. Uh, you know, listen, this has been around for a while in co-branding, and more recently, this has been around with uh, virtual brands. This idea of trying to maximize your real estate by having multiple brands or multiple menus come out of that one footprint. Not a brand new idea, but I do think it's important that today there are a lot more ways in which you can utilize this without it being that traditional co-brand model. And James is careful not to call what they're doing co-branding. Essentially what he says, you know, is they're maximizing their real estate uh, by diversifying the brands and the menus that are coming out of that one space. At the end of the day, they are minimizing their real costs and they're minimizing their fixed costs because of what they're able to do out of that space. But they do this strategically. It's not just develop two brands, throw them in one place and call it a day. They're, they're building out each restaurant to find those synergies. They built out each brand to have those synergies. So some very obvious examples with original hot chicken and uh, with inked tacos. You have a hot chicken taco. Boom. You, you know, these are ways in which you can have those brands um, really uh, cohabitate the space in a way that is not just one brand on the left and one brand on the right. They integrate, they, they use the space in a complementary fashion and find those synergies. 
So in order to do that, the brands cannot be too different. They cannot be too complicated. James talked about the fact that the equipment they put in the kitchen, uh, the, the skews on the menu, all of these things were done very, very strategically so that it could, again, minimize um, the complexities of running this thing and also maximize the potential for the menu and the customer. You know, he, he jokes, but it's kind of true, is they want to make these restaurants so that a 16-year-old can operate it. That's so true of all restaurants, right? You have teenagers who are working these things. Make them as simple as possible. And you can do this a lot more strategically today than you even could in the past. My fourth takeaway is that a, a new way to view ROI is a return on innovation. I like that term. James you know, claims he wants to uh, call that one, and I'll give it to him. Um, that's a good term, the, a return on innovation. And what does that mean? You know, For James, as he explained a little bit later on in the interview, is you don't innovate for innovation's sake. When you innovate, do it so in a way that you're answering demand or you're seeking an opportunity. You're not doing it to be flashy or to have the bells and whistles or get people's attention. You're doing it to create that um, answer to that demand. But one example of how experiential brands is doing this is they've designed these franchises to go internationally soon. Some brands can only dream of going international. Some really old brands have never been able to succeed internationally. Already, just a year out of the gates with experiential brands, they're thinking international because that's how they crafted the franchises. And James uses that as an example on how they are innovating. They are seeing the demand globally for Mexican concept, um, for a hot chicken concept, and they're planning to meet that demand by innovating through these franchises. I think that's a good way to think of how you can make your brand more exciting and how you can um, push forward into the future. Consider innovation, but consider the return on that innovation by strategically meeting demand. My fifth takeaway is that your economic model will determine the longevity of your brand. This is kind of business 101, of course, is you have to have a strong economic model. You have to make sure you're profitable. You have to keep your costs low. These are things that all restaurant owners know. Um, but this is an important foundation to something like what Experiential Brands is doing. And it's a good reminder, I think, to everybody in the restaurant industry you don't need to race to open a bunch of restaurants in order to build a brand that's going to stick stick around a while. It's not a matter of how many of these restaurants do you have, how many franchises will give you a paycheck or give you some money to um, license your brand. That's not what it's about. It's about ensuring strong unit economics. Again, keep your costs low, maximize your profitability. And if you can do that, You'll stick around for a long time because you'll make money. You'll make it so that the franchisee and operating partners are able to keep the doors open and make a living off what you're doing. Again, as James explained, Experiential Brands is doing that strategically from scratch with these brands that they've developed because they recognize with the experience behind them, with James and Aziz and, and the others at NRD Capital and Experiential Brands, they could have opened hundreds of these in no time at all. But that doesn't mean that it's going to flourish, that they could just fall flat on their face. They have to make sure the unit economics are smart and, um, and strong. And as James says, um, you have to make wise decisions on that path to, um, to building a, a long-lasting brand. My sixth and final takeaway is that franchisees today want easy execution and quick return on investment. Of course, that's what franchisees have always wanted. But another thing that is sort of important to remember today, there's a lot more first-time franchisees out there. You think about folks who, because of the last couple of years, might be out of a job or looking for a change in life. Uh, and franchising is offering that. It's offering them the chance to capitalize on the American dream and open their own business. And for those folks who are out there, they're, they're going to be placing a lot of trust into the franchisor, and they're going to be placing a lot of money into the franchisor's, franchisor's hands as well. That's a big investment for a lot of people, of course. And they want to make money on it. You know, of course, you need to have a, an appealing brand, a fun uh, quality menu. Of course, you need those things that make restaurants always succeed and thrive. But especially today, as more folks turn to franchising for their business, they, they want that fast return on investment to justify the expense that they pay to get in on the with the franchise. Um, and of course, they want easy execution. Today, the equipment, the technology available to franchisees 
is um, you know stronger than ever, and it really does help you to run a business efficiently and simply. And you have to think about how you can provide for your franchisees with a simple model, an easy to execute model uh, that is going to maximize profitability and be very appealing to those folks who are out there who are turning to franchising either for the first time or to fill out their portfolio. Those are all my takeaways for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember remember to subscribe to Takeaway wherever you listen to podcasts and to leave your feedback. You can also email me at sam.ocus at informa.com. Thanks again and talk to you next week.